We're here live uh, with Riley McAdams of Pounding the Table. Yours truly, Avi Mash. And we're here with Alex Rodriguez. Alex, I've been a huge fan of yours actually for over 20 years. So I don't know if you know this, but back in the days when you were on the Mariners, then on the Yankees, <laughs> you had that little fling with J-Lo, you know. Now, this is a obviously a very different Alex Rodriguez. I'm glad you gave me the courtesy laugh there. But <laughs> Alex, just kind of starting off, I'd love to introduce you to the world, right? Could you just give us a quick rundown as to, you know, who you are as Alex and really what Embark does at a high level? And of course, we'll dig into that a little bit further. Yeah, sure. Uh, first off, thanks for having me on. Uh, great, to, great to get to chat with you guys. Um, so... A little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Canada. Uh, I've been doing robotics for 15 years. I built the first self-driving vehicle in Canada. Um, and then I've been running Embark for the last five. So we started Embark in 2016. Um, Embark is a self-driving company. And what really differentiates what we do is where we're focused specifically on the trucking industry. And we're focused specifically on building software. And so you can kind of think about that as the two pieces of the Embark business model. Um, and we've actually been running self-driving trucks on public roads longer than any other company in the United States. So uh, over the years, we've, we've really gone from kind of a contrarian bet in the self-driving space um, to now one of the, the oldest, most successful companies uh, working to bring this technology to the market. I'll give a, a very quick overview of how we um, sort of the current state of play. So I mentioned we're five years old. Today, we're just over 200 people. We operate uh, a fleet of trucks in Southern California. So we actually have uh, a whole bunch of trucks that are owned by Embark that have safety drivers in them, but that are operating autonomously on a daily basis. And so we're taking those trucks, we're moving freight for big uh, commercial partners, folks like Knight Swift, folks like Warner, folks like HP or AB InBev. And so we're working with some of the biggest shippers and carriers in the United States, moving freight in the US Sunbelt today. And then, as you mentioned, Embark is in the process of going public. So we announced a SPAC transaction with a company called Northern Genesis Acquisition Corp in June. And when that closes, which we anticipate to happen in Q4 here, it will result in Embark becoming a, a publicly traded company and having a $5 billion valuation in that transaction. That is, is extremely exciting. Lion Electric's another trucking right. company i know they do a lot of stuff in canada so don't sleep on canada you guys are, are doing some good <laughs> so things up there. I, I don't know if you know this or not but lion was northern genesis's first uh yep. nga first was yeah. the ticker yeah that's right big fan so of this them. is ngab yeah exactly <laughs> we were having a quick conversation before the show i before i got into software i was in the logistics doing 3pl and so a lot of this is fun to kind of resurface. And I'm sure we'll get into some deeper questions in, in just a bit here. You didn't talk too much about yourself. I think it's really interesting because you're in your early 20s, I believe, right? So like, how, how does someone in their early 20s, I know, you, like literally before the show, he was calling you Elon Musk of, of your generation, the, literally the next Mark Zuckerberg. He said, I, as a young age, were you one of these Mr. Fixits? You were creating robots while people were playing football type thing? Yeah. So, so I'm 25 for another two weeks. Um, oh, so we'll... Good. Well, uh, it'll still probably celebrate be your birthday. Then. <laughs> life. Yeah. <laughs> My background is, is definitely like I've been doing robotics pretty much since always. So if you go all the way back, the first thing I did is something called first robotics, which is this, um, competition for, uh, school age students. And then they have adult mentors that kind of oversee the teams. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can be involved at, at different ages and it's actually incredibly competitive. There's over 2000 teams, the world final, it's international, world finals are held. Um, the years I did it, it was in the Georgia Dome. So you literally yeah. in the football stadium. That's uh, so cool. So it, was, it is still like one of the coolest things that's ever happened is walking out from behind the curtain for world finals. And you can't see anything because the lights are coming down. Yeah. And you just yeah. hear the crowd of 20, 30, 40,000 people. Wow, um, so they that was the fun. thing up. That's, oh yeah. Oh, that's fun. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. And you're what, like, 15, 16, when, when you first did that, that's insane. So I was, uh, yeah, when we, when we were like first sort of doing that, that top level stuff, I started doing sort of the, the lower levels of first when I was 11. Um, yeah, I, I, work, on your, on your Twitter, out. that's on your profile. Is, uh, <laughs> I was building robots at 11. I laugh at that every time I see it. That's so insane. Yeah. So that was, I always, like, I, I obviously loved that. Um, and I was telling a story to um, a younger first student. They'd asked if they were, if I was willing to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. um, about how sort of first it impacted my life. And it was like for a, a friend. And so I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll talk to, to your daughter and walk her through kind of like my, my first story. Yeah. Um, and I realized that 
uh, it just sounds ridiculous when you sort of hear it out loud. So it's like at 11, I started building <laughs> robots, right? And then at 12, I convinced the coach to get rid of the, the team he had and, and start a team at the next level up because I wanted it to be a bit harder, right? Uh, and so we, we did that. And then uh, when I chose my high school, I picked my high school because it was the only high school in Western Canada with a first robotics team. Mm. And I wanted to be on that team at the, at the top level. So I joined the, that high school. That's and after a year, I was like, eh, the other teams I was on were really good. This team's kind of mediocre. I don't like that. So <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave, go change high schools, start a new, convince that school to start a new first team, build a whole team from scratch with no adult mentors. Wow. Uh, that team made it to world finals. Um, That's amazing. <laughs> I then picked my university based on the ability, like partially so I could do mechatronics engineering at the university, but partially yeah. because of the best first robotics team in the world was like in a nearby city and they'd offered me a role mentoring that team. And I was like, I want to, I want to mentor team 1114. Yeah. Um, so I picked my, my university because of competition robotics. And then mm-hmm. halfway through university, we built the first self-driving vehicle in Canada using all first robotics parts. And then we uh, dropped out and founded Embark where I think a lot of, you know, the early things that we did at Embark were really informed by, by robotics experience. So um, very much my whole life has been uh, like school has been a secondary thing. Building yeah, robots same. has been the main thing. <laughs> I'm just not not robots. That's the one thing. I was not playing robots. Legos when you were playing with robots, but you know, <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's amazing. So let's get let's get back to embark a little bit, right? So quite the incredible journey. And, and I'm fascinated to learn a little bit more about how robotics will play a role, you know, potentially in it within uh embark, of course. But you know, I you're going to these companies, like talk to me a little bit more about the business. Are are you actually the trucks themselves or your, your software but help me understand that from for the common yeah. man such as myself <laughs> <laughs> um so so yeah it's a good place to start so um if you if you think about uh, i think i think about self-driving trucks as sort of in two ways first is how do they operate and then how do, how do like who does what so in how do they operate question um what we do differently in the trucking industry is focus on driving outside of urban areas. And so you have the first and last mile in, for example, Phoenix and Houston, where mm-hmm. you have a local driver in that city and they're driving a manual truck, a regular truck, so a tractor, just like the one behind me. And they will come and pick up the, the freight from the orig- wherever it's originally getting picked up. It could be a store, it could be a factory, whatever. Then they take it to what we call a transfer point. So that someplace near the highway um, that's basically a, a yard and they drop mm. the trailer and that's where the driverless truck picks it up. And then it goes uh, to the, to the next city um, and drops it off and human does the last mile. And so that you can think about the driverless truck is doing 95% of the miles, mm-hmm. but it's the 95% that are easier. Um, yeah. And so that's really important. Right. right. Um, so that's the first thing uh, when you think about what's different between cars and trucks, it's that focus on the outside of urban areas. Um, the second thing is how, or so who does what? Mm-hmm. And there, um, Embark really tries to be focused on what we're best at, which is building the best self-driving software in the world. Mm-hmm. And we partner with the industry as much as we can on the other pieces. So we don't build trucks. There are right. four major OEMs in the United States that do a great job building trucks. Um, we, of course, spend time talking to them and, and also the parts suppliers that go into those vehicles. Um, but we don't try to build our own truck. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then... Similarly, we don't try to be the fleet. So there are, um, you know, hundreds of great fleets in the United States. Um, we work with, I, I mentioned at the top, some of the uh, folks like Knight Swift, who's the number one truck mm-hmm. carrier in the U.S., spectacular organization, um, who knows way more than I will ever know about how to run a really efficient, operations-heavy organization. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're not trying to do that. Um, instead, what we're doing is we're building the software. And so you can think about our contribution is really two parts. We sit down with Knight Swift. Knight Swift buys a truck or anybody else, right? Any, any fleet buys a truck. And uh, we work with them uh, with what we have, what we call Embark Universal Interface, which is our spec for mm-hmm. sensors and compute um, to make sure that they can buy that truck with the right components already on right. it. Okay. Mm. And, and so that truck then arrives to the fleet with a spec that will run our software because we worked with their truck buyer. Mm-hmm. And then now that they have that truck, um, they're able to go uh, they're, they're the one who then takes it out and operates it. And so they're the one coordinating first and last mile, coordinating mm-hmm. maintenance, all of that. 
what Embark is doing is we're licensing them Embark Driver, our software. And so we license that software. They pay us on a per mile basis. So every time that they hit the button, turn the truck on and it's driving itself, they're paying Embark Mm. uh, 30 to 40 cents a mile. Gotcha. And can you talk, I don't know if there is more to the fee structure, if it's that straightforward as just per mile. Is there, I mean, I, now I transition from logistics into to software. Typically there's a, a, a standard fee, you know, an annual uh, contract. Is there anything with that or is it mostly uh, per mile is how you guys charge? Yeah. So it, it, it's all per mile. Um, and the only, the only difference is it, it slightly changes based on uh, the length of haul. And hmm. so, uh, you can think about there being two models of mm-hmm. uh, where Embark can pick up and drop off. In one case, we'll do direct to shipper. And so it's going all the way to sort of the final destination. And that'll be for, for example, distribution centers, which are themselves outside of cities. And so you don't need mm-hmm. um, like a transfer point. Alternatively, you're going to a transfer point and then someone is taking it the, that last mile. And so basically, you can think about the fee structure. The highest fee you pay is if it's going direct to shipper, mm-hmm. because then we're providing maximum value. And then a little bit down from that is if you're on a very long haul mm-hmm. where it's, it's transfer points, but they're really far apart. So you're driving two, three days at a time. Uh, and then one level down from that is at the very bottom will be transfer points on shorter hauls where mm-hmm. there's sort of incremental effort required to hand off the, the trailer. And so we, we actually um, reimburse some of that cost to the fleet um, mm-hmm. to make sure that it's economical for everyone in, in all those cases. So real quick, and then I'll let Riley ask questions because I see you mm-hmm. eager over there. So this is interesting, right? Because like with the drivers, you have to check in, right? You can only drive a certain amount of time. Yeah. So so with that, like now that there's no driver involved, right? If it's driverless, does those rules no longer apply? They can the, can the truck go straight through? Yeah, that's right. So uh, uh, this actually was clarified in AB 3.0 a couple of years ago. It's so like the federal uh, autonomous vehicle frameworks. Um, mm-hmm. And they they this was a big step for us something our policy team was heavily involved in yeah. was getting clarification that all the human rules in the those rules don't apply so you wow. don't need to have your seatbelt buckled in you don't need to pass a drug test and most importantly of course uh the a driverless truck doesn't need to subscribe to the hours of service that that's incredible so yeah that's that's probably the best so part much faster they don't have to stop for 10 hours that, that's huge yeah and wow. so an, one of the questions that i have is so as, as great as that is like someone needs to be able to fill up these, these trucks, these semis, like, how does that process go? Is there, you know, going to be like stations, you know, all over the country where people are just going to fill these up or how does that work? I mean, you mean with gas? Yeah. With the gas. Yeah. Or, yeah, or yeah. electric when it gets to that point. Yeah. So, uh, actually the trucks can go surprisingly far on, on a single tank. And so you, you don't end up, uh, needing to refuel them that many times. You do, you do need to refill them a handful of times on a cross country journey. Typically you can see a truck that can do about 2000 miles. And so mm. that's basically half the country. Yeah. But what we've done part of sort of kickstarting the ecosystem or priming the pump, as we call it, is making sure that there is that ecosystem of, of locations that, that can be used. And Embark has relationships with some of the biggest truck stop operators in the country. Um, so we're one of the, the public ones is a company called pilot flying J they operate 800 highway adjacent truck stop locations across the United States. And we think that's a, a great partnership sort of in the early stages today, but we think it's a really exciting opportunity where pilot or somebody like them can get additional revenue with the truck stopping in mm-hmm. on a cross country voyage. And at the same time, um, truck can get refueled using existing uh, real estate. Yeah. Okay. So, the, so along with that too, is with these semi trucks, like how far can you guys implement your system into like a semi, like say 10 years old, 15 years old, like have you tested 10 year old semis with the systems or is it kind of just new models or like, how does that go? It has to be new. Um, It has to be new. It has to be new. So it's, it's always starting with us sitting down with the truck buyer and making Mm. sure that the base truck is meeting the spec. And then working on sort of what does that upfit look like to go beyond that? Um, but you think about the base truck needs certain pieces in place in terms of computer controlled brakes, steering, throttle, in order for you to be able to then put a self-driving package on top of it. 
Got it. Interesting. And then you were talking about how you guys are doing the long hauls, obviously. Is, is there plans to ultimately a couple years down the road to take that last mile? Or is that something you guys are really just focused on dominating that long, uh, long tail? Yeah. So I think what we'll see is I mentioned those two models, the transfer point versus direct to shipper. Mm-hmm. And what we expect is you'll start off with a lot of transfer point hauling because um, every, everyone can use it. There's no in, in incremental integration required. And then you'll see a transition to more and more direct to shipper that goes to more and more sites directly. Mm-hmm. That said, I don't think transfer points ever go away. Um, I think they serve a really important purpose. And, and part of that is because a truck driver, especially when they're doing pickup and drop off, actually does a lot more than just drive on the road. Right. And so if you think about what actually goes in to enabling direct to shipper, this is a really high stickiness interaction. It's not sort of a, a light switch that you flip. It's really a deep integration because you need... Uh, the paperwork to be digitally digitally uploaded uh, mm-hmm. so that you have the bill of lading, right? You need somebody on site to be trained to do the pre-trip inspection because there's nobody in the truck to do the pre-trip. You need the gate access and location and loading of the truck to all be standardized because that those were all things the driver used to do. And so for bigger shipper locations, for distribution centers, all that work makes sense to do. And it's something that that's why we're working with people like AB InBev and HP to prepare some of their sites over time so they can use this kind of technology however if you think about a two dock safeway uh in downtown san francisco no matter how good your self-driving is it never makes sense to not have a person in that truck to handle all the interaction with the customer at the end point Mm -hmm. you're saying all this i'm just thinking all right there's humans now that are taking that off knowing your background in robotics do you see a world you know maybe again 10 years down the road or there's robots taking them off the truck. You'll definitely see things done piece by piece, right? I actually think there are a couple of companies that, that do semi-automated unloading right now. It's, okay. it's pretty cool stuff. But I think that you'll see it certainly piece by piece, right? That same Safeway, I think the Safeway is probably for a long time just going to stay manual, right? It's all about scale with, with robotics, right? That's why people focus on self-driving trucks first. Because with a single platform, right, with the, the tractor, you can do a 70% of US freight. And that's obviously transformational. And it's, yeah, there's differences state to state, but it's a fairly simple, fairly consistent task versus trying to, I think that's, that's what you'll always see is you start with the really big homogenous tasks for right. robotics that are straightforward. And then you kind of work backwards in complexity, in niche as you, as you scale up the industry. All right. So, so as we're talking all, all these robots, I just got to ask, like, can you talk about muffin? This is one of the things that I, I was reading about. And I gotta, I gotta know what, like, what was the process with all this, like the, the competitive robot stuff, like talk more about that. I, is muffin the I, just, I the love robot. Muffin's the name of the robot. Yeah. yeah I didn't it? like it. I didn't like it at the time, but uh, you know, now, now I'm stuck. Adorable. With it. <laughs> yeah. oh, it's awesome. It's a, it's a great name. Like, and that and like just being able to, you know, go through college and all this stuff and then building the, the golf cart that drives autonomous, like what, what was like kind of the thought process? Why did you pivot from, you know, the muffin to, you know, the autonomous vehicles? Yeah, I think uh, autonomous vehicles have always been, in my mind, the most interesting thing you can be working on if you're a person in robotics. Uh, they sort of sit at, well, let, me, let me give you my like one liner for why I think this is. <laughs> In 2040, when kids look at pictures of 2020, what's the first thing that they'll notice? I think the answer is very clearly, they'll be like, why is there a guy sitting in the front seat of that car driving Mm. it, right? They will be the most notable thing between now and the medium future that humans drive cars. And then kids will ask obvious questions like, you know, they'll be like, oh, he's driving. They're like, you know, isn't that dangerous? They're like, yes. You know, it was the number one cause of death from eight to 35. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> no, it, it right they, they are 100% going to be asking that question. I, yeah, I, I wrote in college, I, I sort of got, I was just getting chills because I was having this discussion about how one day we'll look back and almost like laugh that there was car accidents, right? Like how, how did yeah. that happen? How did people literally allow humans, like you're saying, to drive when people could be drunk or whatever it could be? You know, it's, it's yeah. crazy. Right. Yeah. It'll, uh, it'll be like, you know, today we're like, we let, you know, 
doctors just do stuff without science. They just put leeches on you. They had no idea that it, like whether it was safe or not. <laughs> like, didn't people die? Like, yeah, people died. It was like the best we had, right? Yeah. And that is that is what robotics will be. Once once self driving is here, it will be unthinkable that we ever did it any other way. And yeah. so I think as a roboticist, this is what you want to be working on. And I've spent a lot of time trying to uh, trying to deal with the inherent tension of mm -hmm. self-driving is by far the most interesting thing you can be doing in robotics. It's also very hard. And one of the things I learned over many years of competitive robotics is how important doing something simple is if you want to get it to work well. Mm -hmm. And so there's this inherent tension between those. And you can see, I think, with what we did with the golf cart and then later with Embark, us sort of grappling with this question of how can we do this hugely impactful thing, but do it in a simple way, which is actually solvable. Yeah. So I'm no longer eligible for 30 under 30 because I'm, I'm older than that. But I, I did see that you were the Forbes of 30 under 30. Congrats. You're about to be 26. So you still have a few more years to, to maybe repeat here. But, you know, what, <laughs> what, what does that feel like? You're still a kid in my eyes, you know, but you're not right. You're doing things light years ahead of what I'm doing. You seem like a very humble guy. Like, how do you, how do you maintain that humbleness? Like when you're talking with your friends, you're, you know, there's still 25 year olds going out at night. Right. And so what does that look like? And what are your kind of hobbies outside of Embark? <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it, it, so I'm actually, I'm actually going to speak at the Forbes as a 30 under 30 conference next week, which should be fun. Right. Of course. Um, of course. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be, we'll be talking to that. I think, um, it, it's interesting tension, right? Because at Embark, uh, I've been working on robotic systems, pretty much as long as anybody anywhere in the world. Like I've been doing this for 15 years and it happens that I started when I was 11. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty young still. Right. But yeah, like a lot of the techniques and technologies we're using were invented in that period. And there are a lot of people that, um, so there's very, very few people who have more experience. Mm -hmm. And I think at Embark, it's interesting because inside Embark, it's kind of a non-issue like inside Embark. That's not the thing that you think about when we're mm -hmm. having a conversation. Hopefully I'm mostly giving good input when we're having conversation like that's <laughs> what people care about right yeah um, they don't they don't really care uh about how old you are obviously outside mm -hmm. it's a huge thing mm -hmm. um and it's kind of funny because otherwise i'm sort of a, a ordinary uh 25 year old right uh, i live in a uh flat in sf with three roommates 1800 square feet and like Amazing. i ride an e-bike to work and I'll, I'll still go out drinking not so much this year because it's been busy but yeah <laughs> now, keep your head to the grindstone you said you, you rode a bike to you you ride a bike to work <laughs> yeah, yeah wow that's that's humble right there that's that's the definition of humble one of the one of the questions that i have is uh so you dropped out of out of college which you had to at that point I, but for what i say for what it's worth i'm not an advocate of dropping out of college no no right? no I, in I general don't were. do it if you happen to have a company and a unique opportunity that's obviously like you know yeah. once in a lifetime oh, oh, then maybe sure. consider it right that's yeah. that's my two cents and along with that so the the peter Thiel like fellowship you were you were in that right i'm not too familiar with that and i think a lot of our listeners are familiar with peter like they know a lot of the companies that he invests in dom one of our our team members loves him i mean he, he will invest without even knowing what the company is as long as peter's in it like did you get to meet him or any sort of mentorship from him yeah i think the Thiel fellowship is an amazing program but in the more recent versions, uh, I think I have gotten to spend less time with Peter. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the program itself is is really impressive. If you if I had to like create an index fund in investing, this would be the index fund I would write. I would just write a check to every Teal Fellow. I think about sort of the Teal Fellows that I know. Uh, uh, the, the people that I know that run unicorns are almost universally Teal Fellows. Folks like Austin wow. Russell, who runs Luminar folks mm -hmm. folks like fred turner who runs curative who are spectacular successful people and i think this ties into something sequoia always says one of sequoia's uh sort of key key ideas is invest in people based on slope not intercept based on mm -hmm. the trajectory of the person uh and so i think in general the teal fellowship kind of finds the the best people who don't really have any good reason to be good yet and so that in order to be at that level, you have to have a pretty high slope. Um, and I think it's, it's certainly a very, very cool program. You get to see people go from nothing to, to really successful companies. Almost. It feels like overnight. In reality, it's like five to 10 years, but yeah, like it feels for, like for, 
Yeah. For <laughs> investors like us, like a lot of people will focus on like the founders instead of, you know, the company. And like, for me, that's why it would basically me, you know, wanting to invest in Embark is because of you, not necessarily because of the technology, which is obviously great, but just being able to invest in you is kind of the fun part where I could, you know, get to cheer you on. I get to see what you can do with this company. And like, obviously, like you said, there's other people that were in the program, but, you know, they're also running these unicorns and it's awesome to see that. Everyone's we'll, super we'll young. We'll bring you out to SF and put you in a truck and then you'll be investing awesome. mostly based on the-, the Absolutely. That'd be- Riley would be <laughs> <trading a> smile <laughs> on his face. <laughs> Quick question. So obviously being in SF, you're, you're very, you know, aware and being in your space of what's going on at the ports. I, I see all these tweets and these images of just massive backlog. And so- how has that impacted your business, trucking in general? Does that slow you guys down a little bit in, in terms of the, the business? So there's a few different ways of looking at it. Uh, I would say on the day-to-day level, um, it doesn't doesn't have that big of an impact on us. You do see it certainly. For example, the truck OEMs have to pause production at, at points or um, you know, you see components that'll be harder to get a hold of. And so that's that's certainly challenging, but Embark has pretty good relationships with, with key suppliers. And so we don't, we don't really feel it that much and we're not doing huge scale today in 2021. And so Mm -hmm. it's okay. Um, I think it actually accelerates us though, because when we look at, um, when we look at the problems that people are now surfacing, if you Google truck driver shortage, you'll get tons of articles Mm -hmm. from all around the world, especially in the UK right now, they're talking a lot about it where these are, critical problems and people are realizing oh man this is a really important job and we don't have enough people to do it um, and i think that is a huge motivator to allow us to m- make the job a higher quality job which is something that i think embark can do and and at the same time obviously improve uh our ability to to add driverless trucks and fill in that shortage mm-hmm. and so i think it's um something that's actually driven a lot of momentum for the business right and, and for you guys you may not be as affected because the way you guys aren't the ones, the customers that are losing the, the dollars and the time to transfer from A to B, you guys are on the road, you're doing well. And you brought up an interesting point, right? You hear about this with Uber, right? What happens when the drivers go away from Uber? What happens in your case when the drivers go away from trucking? When you talk to truck drivers, are, are, what, what's their feelings towards driver? Is, are they worried this is taking their jobs away? Uh, are they excited about this? Yeah. So, so we, we firmly believe that everybody who currently works as a trucker will be able to retire as a trucker. And I think that's sort of the, the first message that, that we try to make sure to, to, mm. to bring to the table um, because, you know, it's easy to get caught up in media hype. But the reality is that the transition is going to be methodical, right? You look at Embark's forecast, uh, we're looking at 1.1% of U.S. truck mileage in 2024. Uh, being driverless on our platform, right? And so there's a long way to go from there to to sort of keep scaling that up. Now, 1.1% of US truck mileage is, you know, $860 million of, of revenue to embark, but it's still 1.1%. <laughs> so yeah. it is what it is, right? Yeah. And so when we look at, we look at the scale of the industry, it's a $700 billion industry. It's going to take a while, right? And like I mentioned, driverless trucks aren't everywhere at the switch of a hat. It happens in a methodical way. We're starting in 2024 in the US Sunbelt, and then 2026, we expand to the rest of the country. At the same time, we're starting with a lot of transfer points and then slowly adding more and more direct to shipper. Um, and so I think it's a very methodical transition. And what we'll see is the driverless trucks are filling in the gaps and they're allowing the drivers that work on some of these harder, long time away from family, you know, three weeks out on the road at a time jobs to mm-hmm. instead get jobs locally, right? Instead of me moving freight from one side of the country to the other as a trucker, n- now you can sit and right. spend your day going back and forth to the transfer point in the city that you live. And then you can go home and go to sleep. It's like work, that's- for home, work from home for, for truckers. Exactly. It really when is. truckers say work from home, they just mean like, you know, not all the way on the other side. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, which which I think that that's going to help out everyone just mentally being able to, to, you know, pick up semi trucks. I think you you mentioned in one of the interviews saying, I think the average age uh, of a trucker was like 55, almost retired. I think this was 2017 Disrupt, I believe. Uh, You you mentioned that, so it's probably closer to 60 now. But um, do you think that that's kind of like 
starting to get to the point where you're going to see more younger truck drivers coming into the market or what do you think? Yeah. So I think what, what's challenging is, is that the job is just less attractive to the younger generation, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I don't know among, among your friends, but, but certainly among, among my friends, even ones who are wanting to work in sort of trades type jobs, mm-hmm. they want to work in trades where they can still have a family and have, have a normal life. Right. And when a previous generation being over the road was something that people were more comfortable with. Mm-hmm. I think people are much less comfortable with it today. Um, mm-hmm. And so it, it makes it really hard to attract drivers. That's one of the reasons that big fleets are excited to work with us because when a big fleet starts working with Embark, right? The, the net Im- impact is that that fleet's going to be really successful. They're going to be able to grow the number of lands that they operate on, the number of, of packages they deliver. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, they're going to be able to hire drivers in local jobs and give all of their senior drivers local jobs that they've been wanting and then bring in more. And right. so I think when a, so when driver sees a fleet starting to adopt driverless, the net impact in that, at that company is going to be the the ability to recruit goes up, but the number of people employed goes up. And actually, there's a really interesting study um, from the US Department of Transportation that came out earlier this year. And it said two things. The first is they expected no significant job displacement as a result of driverless trucks, which is exactly what I just said, right? That, that we think everyone who works in the industry now will be able to retire as a trucker if they want. Um, and two, that they studied the broader impact of driverless and they asked the question, how will this affect workers in general? And the answer was they expected more than $200 of average wage increases on an annual basis for the average US worker, not in trucking, but across the entire economy. And that's driven by everything else sits on top of trucking. And so mm. if your trucking is more efficient, then retail is more efficient. Right, and everything. manufacturing yeah. is more efficient and commodities are more efficient. Yeah, it's a domino effect, yeah. Right, it's just like if you made power cheaper, right? It's one mm. of those key inputs that, that goes into everything mm. and it makes the US more competitive as a, as a manufacturing country. Yeah, I, mean, I always used to see it as like the precursor to where the economy is going. And you can see it a few months in advance. All of a sudden there's a ton of trucks, you know, or there's no, no freight going on. We have a few more questions actually from the audience. Do you see AI being restrictive in other nations? So I guess my personal question to piggyback on that is, are you guys global? If not, kind of what are your plans? And then to their question is, you know, around AI. What does that look like from a, a political standpoint? Yeah, yeah. Um... And initially, Embark is focused on the U.S. market, which isn't to say that we don't expect to expand over time, because mm-hmm. I, think, I think as the technology matures, we, of course, expect to bring it to every market where we think there's a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's something that, that you need to do in a methodical way. You need to sort of do the first thing first. And the first thing is to make a great of product course. for the U.S. Sunbelt, right? And then sequence things appropriately. But of course, we hope to bring the technology to every market where, where it's going to be um, able to bring value to people. Mm-hmm. I do think that we're starting to see more and more realization of the impacts of data and AI and self-driving mm-hmm. as national security technology. And I think this is one of the, the reasons that Embark feels pretty good about how we positioned ourselves from a regulatory perspective. Mm-hmm. So Embark is uh, 100% of our data is kept here in the US, 100% of our offices are here in the US, and our, our team has thought very carefully about sort of building government relationships, the former Secretary of Transportation is on our board of directors. So... I think that's really important. It positions us really well. Not all the companies in the space are sort of US focused. And I think there's some competition between US and China on this mm-hmm. point. Uh, and I think Embark really being pretty clear about what side we're on, I think is an advantage when it comes to deployment here in the US, uh, especially as this gets bigger and bigger, right? I think when it's smaller, governments haven't yet started paying attention as much. As it gets bigger and bigger, right? You you. Mm-hmm rather be, be Cisco than Huawei. So staying under the AI, uh, you know, talk, what is the cash burn kind of looking like for you guys while you guys train this AI leading up to, you know, 2024, 2025, when you guys are set to actually, you know, deploy it? Yeah. So I, I can't say any more than what's in the filings. Um, okay. But, uh, but what I can give you at a, at a high level is Embark expects that, so the, the SPAC transaction will raise $614 million net of redemptions. Mm-hmm. And we expect with that money, it funds us through 2024 with incremental cushion. And so mm-hmm. one of the things we're really excited about the SPAC opportunity is it allows us to fill the war chest, basically, mm-hmm. to execute against what we're planning to do and take that sort of that piece of the, the equation off the table. 
touching on that a little bit more, walk me through the the SPAC process, right? There's been a lot of noise, you know, a few months ago, like every SPAC was just flying off the shelves and, you know, people would just blindly grab a SPAC, right? Um, learning more about your company, I, I feel like you guys are going to be one that definitely breaks through uh, that narrative. And, you know, wh- why did you guys, I guess, go that route versus a traditional IPO? Yeah, I think that definitely the the universe of SPACs um, has good companies and bad companies. And we've right. seen, like, there was a period where nobody bothered to check the difference. And I think we're now at a spot where right. good companies do really well, but but it's certainly harder for companies that maybe shouldn't have been with the product in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, for Embark, we really had a lot of options. And I think that's certainly one of the things that, that differentiates the good companies from the bad companies is did you pick mm-hmm. this? you know, from a position of strength or a position of weakness. And for us, it was certainly one option among many. But I think what was really attractive for us was that it gave us the opportunity to tell the story in a tighter way with investors. And what I mean by that is really, really two things, right? One, we got to work with Northern Genesis, um, who's highly respected. Obviously, Lion was a huge success, very knowledgeable. Um, And we were actually able to bring the Northern Genesis team out, put them in the truck, have them go for a ride, have them sort of see under the hood under NDA. And so they were able to really get a level of confidence about how solid the technology was. And that was extremely helpful when we went to have conversations with the rest of the investor world, because now you have these very credible guys who are able to say, yeah, we've been there. Um, we've seen the vehicle and the technology is real, right? It's sometimes hard to tell in technology businesses for an investor who can only spend an hour or two on it. How do they know? And so having somebody who could speak to that, who was highly credible was very useful. Um, and then the pipe process we thought was was a really positive one where we were able to actually get to know investors under NDA with a little bit more of an opportunity to share more of the future of looking vision, which you can't really do in an IPO. Mm-hmm. And so we got to know the investors a little bit better and build those relationships. And so um, I think it's a really exciting product. I think it's going to go through additional waves. We're definitely not done here mm-hmm. and uh, sort of figure as it figures itself out. I think it's really useful in some some cases. And at the same time, there needs to be some of the uh, chickens coming home to roost for people who didn't look where they were putting their money. Right. Love that analogy. We're going to hit you with one final question here is just thinking about the future. Obviously you're, I don't know if you self-proclaimed futurist, I'm looking at you as a a futurist here and really, you know, focused on where, where the truck is going per se. What what are you most excited about for Embark over the next five years? And and where do you potentially see you guys going in in 10 years? Is this something that potentially could get into to shipping or or, or planes or, you know, what does that look like potentially? Yeah. So I think Embark is going to be very methodical. Um, If, if, if we hit our goals that are already public, the 2024 Sunbelt 2026 and continue to scale sort of to the rest of the country. And then that puts us in a position in 28 and 2030 to really be looking at how do we, how do we continue to grow mm-hmm. the business and, and expand it out? So I'm not going to speculate too much on where we'll take that. I think that, that you know, we'll have to wait and see. Um, sure. But I think uh, what I tell the, the Embark team is one of the things that makes Embark special is that what we work on is meaningful. And the definition of meaningful in my mind is does it get more or less important as you get more and more time perspective looking back on it? Mm-hmm. And I think it, it would be, it's very clear that when we look back on this, you know, with, with my grandkids, which, you know, my age will be a little while. Um, <laughs> but when I look on back on this from, with my grandkids, this will be incredibly impactful because this is the start of something really big. Right. And I think that's mm-hmm. one thing that makes Embark a, a little bit different than your everyday SaaS business, right. Where yeah. it's the start, but maybe the SaaS business at the end. Um, yeah. And Mark is really one of a handful of companies at a frontier of what's going to be a, a, a bigger than, by a significant margin, bigger than SaaS, bigger than mobile phones. Yeah. And so it'll be a lot of fun to, to get to be a piece of that, that wave. That's incredible. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I think thank you, Alex. When I look back awesome. with my, my grandkids, I'm going to say, <laughs> hey, you know, I had a conversation with Alex and with Embark you know, early on. So (laughs) thank you so much for joining us today, Alex. I really appreciate it. We're excited to see where you guys go, where you go individually and, and really where Embark can go over the next couple of years. So we'll be watching. The ticker symbol is NGAB. Riley needs to get in the truck out out in San Francisco. So really appreciate (laughs) your time and, and look forward to connecting again later on. Awesome. Thanks guys.